Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome Chris Avalon. Yay, thank you. Hello, hello. Hello, do I, have to, do I have to switch this? Oh my, wow, I sound so powerful. That's amazing. Ah. Uh, so, hey, thank you all for showing up. I appreciate it. I love it when people come to my talks and then leave disappointed. That's fantastic. Uh, I want to thank Swedish Game Arena for having me out. Uh, I am not jet lagged at all. I am not exhausted and tired, but I'm very excited to be here. So that's great. Um, I'm Chris Avalon. Um, it's really good that I remember my name because sometimes I really don't. Uh, I design computer games. Uh, it's what I do for a living. I enjoy it very much. I usually do writing. Sometimes I get to do level design, sometimes I get to do system design, but usually it's writing. And over the past year and a half, I've worked on uh, Prey with Arcan Studios, where to my delight, you can play as the world's most dangerous coffee cup. Like, literally, you can shape shift into a coffee cup, and you're the most dangerous thing in the galaxy. So please, be careful while playing Prey, because everything's out to kill you. Uh, I'm also working on Divinity Original Sin 2, and I was also part of the successful System Shock reboot. So if any of you helped back that, thank you very much. If anyone ever asks if you would like to write Shodan, the answer should always be yes. She's awesome. Also, I have a number of other mystery projects coming up. Uh, hopefully, it will be announced within a year, but we'll see how that all goes. So this is not my first time at Swedish Game Arena. I was here last year where I shared various tales of woe that I had experienced uh, in the game industry. But this year, I'm going to cover a new set of topics. And they're going to include the word impossible, the idea of the kitchen sink, my fear of toilets, <laughs> penguins, Weddings, when things get complicated, commitment, the horrible, horrible breakups that can occur, doing research, the idea of intelligence, sad writer stories, people are stupid, <laughs> the nature of cool, how ambience begins at home, how to name your baby, the care and feeding of your parents, how to hack people, <laughs> entitlement, why Shodan is right, money, weightlifting, covering your ass, <laughs> and the importance of taxi drivers. So first up, the word impossible. So many, many years ago, a programmer told me something I requested as a designer was impossible. Uh, I took him at his word because impossible is a very clear definition. It simply cannot be done. So I was wrong, and so was he. The best thing was he discovered a few months later that it actually wasn't impossible, and he neglected to tell me, which made me doubly sad. The, what I wanted to have done was, hey, take the save data of a previous game in a series, record, like, snag bits of information from that previous save game, and use it in a sequel. And he's like, that's just simply impossible. We cannot do that. Now, what he really meant was he couldn't imagine how the user interface would work, which wasn't his job. And so two failures took place there. One was, I should have asked more questions. I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't realize you weren't a user interface designer. Oh, wow, I should have asked that. But he should have also realized that he could get the data but translating into a new game, maybe he could have delegated that to somebody else. So my lesson here is the blame lay with me because I didn't dig deeper with my questions, but impossible is a pretty useless term when applied to most developer problems. Often any impossible situation just requires more definition of what the time and the resources are to actually get to the root of what the impossibility is about the problem. And usually it's not impossible. It's just like, well, that would take 20 years to code, or we don't have 100 area designers in the pipeline we have. Those are all very valid reasons, but you need to actually drill down and figure out what the impossibility of the situation is. Next up, the kitchen sink. Um, I don't know if you guys have this expression here in Sweden, but uh, in America we have uh, everything and the kitchen sink, which means you throw everything you can into a situation to solve a problem. Now in game development, 
that can mean that every single idea you have about a game, you try and cram it in to the game itself. And I'm here to say that there is always going to be a sequel or a DLC. So for anyone who's afraid of actually flushing their idea or they'll never get a chance to use it, you're absolutely wrong. Unless you actually quit the game industry, there will always be another title out there where you can take that particular idea and then move it into the, the, next, the next sequel, the next iteration of a game. The idea won't be lost. In fact, the idea might even become even more fun in the next iteration of whatever game you're working on. So penguins. Um, so last year I talked about it's not really the idea of a design, it's more the execution and what you do with it. And the example I used was Batman, because Batman, you know, at, at its core is a really stupid idea. Like, he's this rich guy that dresses up like a bat and fights crime. It's stupid. Like, it's just dumb. And so, you know, I, I use that a lot. And eventually, when my colleagues came up, he's like, you know, Chris, that, <laughs> Batman's easy. Like, Batman's cool. Like, th there, there's possibilities there. What you should really do is take the penguin and try and figure out how to make the penguin cool. And I'm like, ha, Arkham City already did it. I've already trumped you. I mean, Arkham City took a pretty horrible concept for a Batman villain, where he's thematically a penguin, that's not very, not, not very great. But then they did a few great things with him. They're like, well, let's focus more on the mobster angle. We'll give him a Tony Soprano kind of feel. Uh, we'll actually change the focus of his anger from not just Batman, but we'll also have him focus on Bruce Wayne, too, and have him blame the Wayne family for his, for his financial collapse. That makes the Penguin pretty darn interesting, in my opinion. If that's not enough, there's also a number of other stories out there by much better authors than I could ever hope to be, where they actually do some really interesting things with the penguin. They have the penguin fall in love, they give him some human qualities, but they also emphasize what makes the penguin a real nasty bad guy. And the reason is he's strangely sensitive. The uh, example that I like to use is there's a series of comic books called The Joker's Asylum, where he focuses on each of the Asylum cast members, and he, and he focuses on the Penguin. And he tells the story of the Penguin, where he's going on a date with this girl. Uh, they're in a very posh restaurant. Everything seems to be going well. And then the Penguin hears one of the cooks laughing too loud. And this is something that happens to all of us every day. You're not sure if that person is laughing at you, or they're laughing at something completely unrelated. But what makes the penguin nasty is he always assumes someone's trying to attack him. And then he retaliates on a factor of 10. In this particular story, the penguin over like two pages systematically destroys this cook's life, like destroys his career, unfortunate things happen to his family, uh, a number of them are committed, some of them go to jail. He just wipes, he just wipes this person out because of a single laugh that he misinterpreted. And that is the sensitivity evil of the penguin. And I think that's fascinating. So now moving on to weddings and why they're important. Um, actually, in case you guys are curious, I actually found uh, this picture not on a wedding ring site, but from, but from a laser hair removal site, which I thought was <laughs> fascinating. So sometimes I talk about how inventory items can change uh, ch how inventory items can tell stories. And in this particular instance, it relates to weddings. So I was playing through one game where they had an option where basically you're fighting a bunch of zombies. But if you find a zombie leader and take him down, which requires a lot of effort, um, then all the zombies go back to normal. And, and I was tired and I was kind of pissed off because there's a lot of zombies. And I'm like, I'm not going to go find the zombie leader. Like, I don't care if they'll revert back to human after I kill this leader. I'm just going to go wipe them all out. So I'm blasting through all these zombies, and I'm having a pretty good time. And then I kill one zombie, and I go to loot it, and I find a wedding ring on it. And as soon as I found that wedding ring, I did a complete 180, felt horribly ashamed because that one wedding ring is an inventory item suddenly reminded me that these were all people. And that changed the entire experience for me. And all through the power of just one simple wedding ring. Uh, the nature of complica complicated. 
Um, so I do a lot of freelancing, and part of the a lot of the jobs for freelancing is I get to evaluate stories or quest lines or characters. And one of the things that I sometimes hear is, you know, we really think this story is going to be too complicated for people. Like, there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of explanation. And my standard answer is, is it more complicated than one season of Game of Thrones? And the answer is usually no. In fact, it's much simpler than that. And I'm like, well, how long is your game? Because if your game is more than 13 hours, you're probably in really good shape. <laughs> and they're like, okay, so it, the point is, the, a story may seem complicated when you're trying to condense it down to 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour, but if you focus on the more episodic approach for storylines and recognize that as long as the player knows what the central conflict is from scene to scene, and in Game of Thrones you usually do, like every scene you know generally who the bad guy is, you know what their agendas are, and you know what the good guy should be trying to get out of this situation. But then games have an added advantage in that not only should you have that set up, but if a, if a piece of lore or technology or a certain plot point seems really complicated, then just make a quest around it because games are interactive. And if a player actually plays through a quest that like, involves a key piece of lore you think they might understand, having a quest like that makes them part of the experience and understand the core elements about that supposedly difficult point in the story. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, so commitment. Uh, commitment is being, uh, is, is doing a design doc, um, and I think one of the responsibilities of a designer when they do a design doc or any developer is you be committed to what you're putting on paper and what you're suggesting. There might be things you need to discuss, there might be things you need to brainstorm, but ultimately don't, don't put maybe, or if, or I kind of think this, or it might work like that, present your, put your best foot forward and go, this is the design that I think will work best. I recognize that there will be changes, but I'm not going to be wishy-washy or maybe about it. I'm gonna be definite. There's not gonna be any TBDs in my design doc, no maybes. I'm just gonna be definite. Like, don't try, just do or do not. Like that, Yoda had it right. Breakups. Um, a lot of relationship stuff here. It's important. I'm, 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 working, I'm working this stuff out. The uh, breaking up, the reason I bring this up is because not only is it important how you start a project and how you go through production and go through the quality assurance process, I'm talking about when a project like comes to an end end. And the things you should keep in mind is you should already have a process in place for how to close down a project completely. And what I mean by that is you want to be sure you take any developer not associated with the project anymore off of Confluence updates. There's a shocker. You can learn so much about a company if they don't take you off Confluence updates. You're like, well, oh, that is their next project. Oh, wow, that looks like trouble. Um, that's things like Dropbox, Confluence, uh, and also, one error I've seen with game studios when they bring a project to a close is they don't actually store the information they learn from the project or the assets from the project in multiple locations in ways where they can access it again easily for the right reasons. And what I mean by that is if you close down a project and you've tracked all the time it took to do the various assets as well as the milestone deliveries, there may be a point in the future where you need to refer back to that data and go, well, you know, how, how many area designers do we have on that project? How long did it take them to create that asset? Those are very valuable metrics to have and build upon for the next game. So in closing down a project, making sure that stuff's stored safely, preferably in multiple locations, making sure you close off any extraneous contacts with like freelancers or contractors, that will be to your benefit. Next bit is about research. Now, developers obviously should do their research, but the reason I bring this point up is because sometimes it's easy to forget that people not part of core development also need to be able to do their research. And what I mean by that is, if any of you have seen the new version of Battlestar Galactica, and I'll keep this very vague in case you still want to watch it, um, there's a character who has one of his eyes plucked out. And that's pretty gruesome, um, but when watching the extra features for Battlestar Galactica, he started complaining about it. He's like, 
well, you know what, I, I would really like to know this information, this would be good. And the reason he was asking about it is because usually actors would get scripts like almost like right before recording. But the reason he was complaining about it, and it was valid, was he needed time to research what that experience was like for people that had gone through that kind of trauma. Because he wanted to be respectful to people that had gone through that trauma, and that's part of what being an actor is about. And that's not part of the core development process for things like voice actors, for example, but you need to let them know more things about their character that they need to be able to research as well. Intelligence. Um, I was in a leads meeting where uh, one of the leads said, and I'm going to paraphrase, but he said, if this is done intelligently, it will be intelligent. And I almost lost my shit. I'm like, that is a recursive argument. It means nothing. You're not even bringing up the idea that the action that you're suggesting, if we should even be doing that or not, you're just suggesting that the action itself, if done intelligently, will be intelligent. And I'm like, that makes no sense. And then it reminded me of the other things that sometimes leads, producers, managers will do to try and convince you that their otherwise questionable goal or solution is in fact questionable. And one of the favorite expressions is, hey, come on, you're not a dumb person. You realize that X is true. And I'm like, whoa, I, I am a smart person. I'm still going to question your core argument. Please don't use that recursive argument on me because I'm not a, you're implying that if I don't agree with you, that I am in fact a dumb person. And generally, I hear that from producers, which is pretty fantastic. So be on your guard. So sad writer stories. So I obviously get to meet a lot of budding potential writers and actual writers in the industry. And I usually have very sad information for them. And the sad information is, you usually have to spend most of your time mimicking someone else's tone, uh, whether it's a project director, whether it's George Lucas, whether it's whoever's, whoever's in charge of that franchise. A lot of your writing skill is going to depend on how you can match their pacing for the feel of whatever franchise or project you're working on. Rarely will you be able, be able to develop your own ideas or actually be able to only or, or do you, the characters you want to do unless you're in a very, very small setting. And if you are in that setting, good for you. The larger game industry for writers, not quite so for forgiving. So people are stupid. Uh, I usually hear this uh, from people that have been trying to explain an idea three or four times to their team, and their team just seems too stupid to get it. And my feeling is that if you have to explain it three or four times, chances are there's probably something wrong with your idea, especially if multiple people are asking questions about it and they don't seem to get it. And in those instances, I always encourage people to step back and, and ask themselves, is there something about this idea that's not clicking with people and try and figure out what those problems are? So being cool. If you read a lot of pitches, sometimes you'll see that people tend to describe their game in very vague terms. And I will be, my opinion is that to be cool, be specific. Like, it's great that you have cool characters. It's really great you have engaging conversations. I don't really care about that shit. What I want to hear is, oh, you have an idea for a cool character? Like, you know, what, what is the exact cool idea you have for this character? Like, you see, you see you have interesting locations. Well, are the interesting locations as cool as a transvestite sentient street? If so, that's an interesting location. And by the way, that's a real location in Doom Patrol, which was a, I'm like, oh my God, it's a transvestite street. And it's, it's helping out Doom Patrol. That's fantastic. Be specific, but don't, but don't be vague in your pitches and presentations. Details go a long way. And you don't have to do a lot of them, just like two or three examples, and then just go from there. Ambience begins at home. Um, this one's a little odd, but, you know, it bears repeating. The formation of your game begins in descriptions that people don't even see. And what I mean by that is, supposing that a development member, one of the developers is describing a spell as like, well, this isn't really, I, it's kind of like, you know, hack, it's kind of like hacking microorganisms. And that's how we want possession to work for this fantasy setting. 
And what they do is they use more sci-fi descriptions to describe more of a fantasy effect. And by creating sort of those, those descriptions, they're actually causing a break in understanding between the two genres and concepts. And what's worse is when people see things like, oh, well, demonic possession works more like hacking micro microorganisms, which is bizarre, but people have described it that way. It actually causes more people to use as an example for their descriptions, and it ends up spreading throughout the project. So it's best to kill that as quickly as possible. This also ties into how to, how to name your baby. And by baby, I mean systems. Um, even if a player may never see it, um, the, the, how you name your systems is very, very important. Like if you're trying to create like a dramatic crisis system for a game and give it weight and importance, you don't call it the hijink system. Like you don't call it the Tom and Jerry system. You call it the crisis system because chances are the public will hear about the name of the system. People within the studio have to buy into the nature of the system. Name the system correctly to emphasize what it's supposed to do. Don't give it a casual throwaway name. Hacking people. I suggest hacking people because not only is it fun, but it saves everybody's time. And what I mean by this is uh, I read a book called The uh, Four Hour Work Week by a guy, Tim Ferriss. Uh, he has a lot of really interesting ideas about how to approach the workplace, mostly to save time. But one thing that he suggested is sometimes when you evaluate how people behave and how much time is spent on certain activities, you can actually write people scripts for what they should do. And this, this happens all the time in customer service. The example that he was using was when he was running his company, um, he noticed that a certain number of issues from customer service would consume a lot of his time to review. And he was actually able to attach a cost to it. And once he evaluated that, he wrote a people script. And he's like, everybody in customer service, if you are encountering a problem with a customer that will cost less than $100 to solve, I give you the authority to refund their money, to solve the purchase, and that's it. And he saves so much of his time by actually setting up a conditional like that. And you can do that in game development too. I used to have a, a programmer that would stop by three, or five, three, three to five times a day. He'd ask a question about something he was working on. And eventually I noticed that often the questions were sort of all over the place. So I suggested a people script. And I'm like, well, you know, dear programmer, uh, I noticed you come by with a lot of questions during the day. I don't mind answering those, but if it doesn't impact your workflow for the day, can you wait until you accumulate three questions and then come see me at a certain point in the day, at which point I'm more than happy to answer them. But that would be more productive than three to five interruptions during the day. And he agreed and he understood. So the care and feeding of parents. Uh, what I mean by this is not only do you have to train juniors, uh, not only do you have to work with people around you, but sometimes you have to train people above you in terms of what wastes time versus what's actually helpful. Um, and the example that I like to use is meetings. Um, there's, in my opinion, there's, there's three types of meetings. There's decisive meetings, there's informative meetings, and there's also brainstorming meetings. Now, brainstorming meetings, usually I see purpose in those because you wanna get a lot of discussion of ideas and you know, trade back and forth. Inf informative and decision-making meetings, however, I have kind of a different opinion about. I feel that once you actually provide all the metrics and the facts for a situation, there's usually one person who makes that decision, and as long as they have all the facts, they can usually make it without a meeting. So, one thing I would do to train upwards is I would ask for an agenda, like 24 hours before the meeting. i say, hey, give me your goals. You know, what's this meeting about? What questions do you have? And when I got the agenda, I would immediately go through and answer everything because it's all facts, and I can just throw those out, throw those out there, send them off to the decision maker, let them make the decision, and even better, because, I, because they wrote an email to me, rather than consume seven people's time for an hour, and I write them a five-minute email back, that saves so much time, and also the notes for the meeting which is also another question mark that usually happens, has already been provided to the decision maker as well. So they actually have that to refer back to if they need to. So entitlement. Um, 
I think people should have titles. That's crazy. I think titles solves a lot of problems in game development. I think when you have like a lead system designer, a lead level designer, a lead creative designer, that sort of helps organize the project almost by default. One of the arguments I've had uh, with various companies is as long as there's somebody to do the job, titles really aren't that important. And the bad thing to do is if that person is a CEO, don't respond with, oh, so you mean you being a CEO, that title isn't important because that will get you in trouble. So don't say that. But what I like about titles is it tends to answer a lot of questions uh, before they actually become questions because people know by what their title is who's in charge of what. Like everybody on the team knows. So once you have these established roles and you're like, okay, well, this guy's in charge of systems, levels, story, and then you have a problem occur on a project, like, man, we're having a real problem with the optimization on these levels. Like, they're just lagging, they're slow. You can glance at any designer and go, okay, well, that's probably the lead level designer's responsibility. Let's go talk to him about it. But if you've given him the title, chances are the lead level designer is already looking at that problem because they know it's their responsibility based on their title. They've been empowered to solve that situation based on the responsibility that you've defined for them. And that makes everything a lot easier. So why Shodan is right. So if you're not familiar with Shodan, Shodan's a malevolent AI that has taken control of Citadel Station, which orbits, Ju orbits, orbits Saturn. And uh, she's trying to turn all the humans on the station into either cyborgs or mutants. And then she's going to blow up every city on Earth. I love Shodan. I think she's the best manager in the world because I know where I stand with Shodan. She thinks I'm an insect, she thinks I'm a bug. I'm great, like she wants to stomp on me. But the hierarchy is very, very clear. She's made that very clear for me. And that's why I wish Shodan would give manager lessons. Money. So one of the unpleasant truths about the industry is that money is one of the big ways that you're communicating how valued uh, your employees are or how valuable you are to a company. So when awarding money to employees, uh, it's important that you don't delay, thing like, delay things like raises or reviews or be unclear about it, or even worse, be inconsistent about how you assign money to a title or a grade of a developer. I've been in situations in the past where, for various reasons, inconsistent salaries were applied to people on the same tier for unclear reasons. And the experience I've had is that always comes back to bite you because someone's always going to find out about it. They're going to have the same questions that perhaps you do about how that happened. And usually the reasons aren't really that well thought out. But you need to be careful about it because people take the amount of money that you're giving them as their salary, and they, they assume that's their worth to the company. Worse is if you have those salaries tied to reviews, and you also have titles tied to reviews, and you're unclear and consistent about that, that's also sending a message to everybody in the company that you don't value their time and you don't value what they're bringing to the company because you're not taking care of these things in a consistent manner. So it's something to be very, very careful of. Next up is weight training. This is more in regards to pulling your weight on a team. And it starts very, very early. I specifically mean this in the classroom. So when you start your game degree, and you're part of a group project, and you're in the classroom with a bunch of other budding game developers, you know, maybe you're making your game right now, you start getting judged day zero. Um, I run into students who don't feel as motivated to contribute to group projects. They don't see the money. They don't see the value in it. They've got other things to do. They don't feel like doing this particular project. The problem is, Everybody who's in that class with you, everybody's in that school with you, they're going to become your future colleagues. And they're going to judge you based on everything that you've done as soon as you started getting into the game program. So if you're part of a group project, 
please pull your weight. It's the, your reputation in the game industry does matter, and it may be the deciding factor between deciding factor in terms of if someone does hire you down the road because they might judge you on your school performance. Hmm. This is a picture of an ass with a cover. Ah, covering your ass. Yeah, I should have figured that one out. Uh, what was I going to say about this slide? Oh, I know. All right. So covering your ass is usually refers to cowardly behavior. Like, you know, this, you know, I, 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 I as, long as, as long as I protect myself. I think you're, you're, the ass in this situation should be the entire project. And there's ways to protect your entire project uh, in a non-cowardly manner. And the way you do that is you make sure there's a variety of metrics for how long different parts of the process in a project are taking. And you make sure those metrics are as transparent as possible to everyone. And um, if you see a problem with the process, that makes a very non-judgmental way for you to point where a project is going slower, whether it's going faster, but usually slower at a certain point. And you're like, well, this is actually causing a drag in terms of when we want to release this project because this particular department's going slower than the other one, or I'm going slower than the other one, or I need help in this particular area. Now, if you bring that to the attention, you can do it in a very non-judgmental way, that's a way of waking people up to a, the overall problem and also potentially suggesting a solution, like, hey, maybe we should downscope this part of the game. Maybe, like, how important is this aspect? Because it actually is causing the project to continually slip and slip. What are we going to do about it? The other problem can be is if you bring up that problem, uh, there's a chance that you might get an answer like, well, what do you expect me to do about it? Or I don't really see what we can do about it. At that point, you might be in a bad situation. In which case, you might want to, again, consider the generic option of covering your ass and having a plan B. So in your career, you'll find that reviews matter a lot less or difficult arguments matter a lot less or angry negotiations matter a lot less if you always have a plan B. If you've already figured out your options for if things go south, you will find that any of those situations become far less stressful because you know that if it all goes to shit, you, have, you absolutely know exactly what you're going to do and where you're going to go. And this is going on a bit long, so I'm going to finish this up. I was going to talk about producers and how you should test them because they're in charge of expensive shit. Uh, and I noticed that a lot of producers in the industry aren't tested for anything, which is really worries me. And there's a lot of producer tests that you can do, including their correspondence, their ability to say I'm sorry a lot. But uh, I can go over that outside the conference at some point. This guy sleeping at his desk. Ah, taxi driver. I'll finish with this one. So uh, it's impossible to experience the whole range of the world. But taxi drivers have heard a lot of interesting stories. And I'm sure my girlfriend's sick of this. Uh, I'm sure my friends are sick of this. But whenever I get in a taxi cab or an Uber, I start asking them questions. I'm like, hey, you know, how's your day going? Start really simple before you really go for it. You're like, so what's the worst fare you ever had? And when you ask that question, the variety of responses you'll get back are fantastic. Add them all to your character library and your story library because they have had the best experiences ever. And if it goes to a weird place, like the guy starts talking about like how he collects obituaries or, you know, a little, he's a little too focused on porn or like, he starts slowing the car down, looking for a Anyway, as long as the, if the car slows down, you can always jump out. But it's really worth asking the question. So anyway, to wrap it up, uh, any questions? But those are the things that I have learned over the past year. It's a mishmash of stuff, but I wanted to share them with you guys. And I definitely appreciate being here. So thank you.